Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to this lecture number 17 on the course on consumer psychology. Now in the previous classes, we have dealt with two important sections in this consumer psychology class. We dealt in section 1 with what is consumer psychology, the basics of it, the methodology which is used in doing consumer research and understanding what is market segmentation and what role does market segmentation has to play in consumer behavior. And in this section itself, we also dealt with something called uh, the decision making process of the consumer. So, right from information search to problem recognition to understanding uh, the, or realizing the problem, realizing the need for a particular product to looking at products and doing alternate evaluation and selecting the final product. And then doing something called post purchase evaluation. So, once you buy a product, how are you satisfied with it or not and how do you stay with the product. So, that was what was section 1. So, it was describing the process of consumer behavior and describing how consumers actually make decisions. In the next section, we dealt with certain psychological factors which affect consumer behavior. We started with perception, important psychological variable, how it helps or shapes consumers perceptions, consumers behavior into the marketplace and the marketers behavior into the marketplace. Then we moved on to memory learning and cognition which is an important psychological variable which modulates or which furthers, shapes, transforms the behavior of the consumer as well as the marketplace which enriches the interaction between the consumer and the marketer into the marketplace and leads to a healthy relationship between these two uh, entities, the consumer and the marketer, the one who is manufacturing and the one who is actually using. Then we looked at motivation and emotion as important psychological variables which shape the interaction between consumer and the marketer or in a better way it is how does it the motivation and emotion shape or influences consumer behavior. Next to it we saw in the last class another important variable which affects the consumer and that is attitude. So, what we did in the uh, last class is we looked at attitude from a psychological point of view. We define attitude as a reaction towards something, an idea, a person, a concept, anything and this attitude com is composed of three parts. It is composed of a behavioral component, a cognitive component and an affective component. Now, the cognitive component of an attitude is the belief you have. For example, any person any idea, you have a belief, you have some information about that which comes from previous knowledge. So, this is the belief component for attitude. Then there is something called an effective component which is how you feel about that particular idea, concept or uh, person and then there is the behavioral component which is given the fact that you have to react to that person, concept, idea, how do you react to it? That is the behavioral component and so these three parts is what we studied into the last class. Now, an important concept or an important uh, influencer of attitude is attitude change. Just studying the attitude is not going to help us because it will just know what a person feels, what a person thinks and how a person would react in a certain situation. So, what is important for the marketer, what is important for the consumer is how his attitude change. For a marketer, it is very important to find out how consumers attitude change. And so, we looked at two basic processes of changing attitude. One is called persuasion, the other is called cognitive dissonance. Now, persuasion on one hand changes attitude through external mediums. For example, TV advertisements, written articles, editorials, people's viewpoint, word of mouth and so on and so forth. On the other hand, attitude change through a person's internal dynamics, through a person's internal system basically involves cognitive dissonance. 
right? So how a person changes attitude from within himself and that happens when a person behaves and thinks in two different ways. So if a person behaves indifferently than what he thinks, there is a, a war between what he believes and what he thinks and this war leads to changing of the attitude either or changing of the behavior, one thing it can lead to trivialization of the matter or it can lead to change of the attitude as such. So these are the direct methods and then there is an indirect method where you forget this discrepancy and focus on some good things. So this is what we did in the last class. Now towards the end of the last class, we took this definition of attitude and attitude change and utilized it in understanding the behavior of the consumer and marketer into the marketplace. So what we did was we looked at how the belief system basically in the last class we focused on the first two parts of attitude which is the belief, the cognitive component and the effect, the effective component. So how these two are changed because what is important to us as a consumer researcher is to understand how consumers attitude are changed because that will lead to him buying new products or involving in new products or moving on from his own products, right. And so what we did was we looked at how the belief system has changed because the belief is an important part of attitude because a change in the belief will lead to change in the consumer attitude towards the product class, product category, service or so on and so forth. So we looked at several methods, for example, there are several positioning systems, positioning of the product in certain ways which can actually lead to the belief, the knowledge they have about the product. Further on, we looked at how the effective component can be changed and in there we discussed a very important model of, of changing of the effective component of an attitude and how this change in effective, effective component leads to a further change in the attitude as such of the person towards a product or service. We looked at the theory of functional theory of attitude change. Now in the present class what we are going to do is we are going to look at two important theories which are important in changing people's attitude. So we will look at the Fishbein models and we will also look at the belief importance model and both these models look at how effective component of the attitude helps in changing people's attitude towards a product class or a product uh, service. And towards the end of this lecture, we will also look at the behavioral component, how the behavioral component change in something in the behavioral component, change in, in the behavioral component or behavioral intention leads to change of the attitude. That is what we are going to do into the uh, class. So let us start with the first model which is changing people's affective component which finally leads to change in the attitude of the person. So we have the first model which is called the Fishbein model. And so what is the Fishbein model? The Fishbein model basically it directly relates to consumer's belief with effective response. So basically what the first Fishbein model does is it actually tries to study or they relate what consumers believe and what they feel about a product and it explains how changing the belief or the effective uh, component, what should be done or how it should be changed so that the overall attitude of the person changes. Now the effective response are made up of two di uh, different factors. The effective response which is the feeling response of a person towards a particular attitudinal object is made up of two factors. The feeling that they have about something about a product or a service is made up of two things. First, the strength and weakness of a consumer's belief about a brand and its attribute. So the feeling develops from how strong the consumer believes that a brand or attribute, attribute of the brand is desirable. That is what it is. So how weak or strong he believes a certain attribute of a brand is for him. And this belief comes from the knowledge, how much knowledge he has about the brand, right? And the second component of which the effective response is made up of is consumer's evaluation of the feeling towards that attribute. So whenever a person buys a particular thing or tries to feel about a brand or a service, he gathers knowledge about it and develops a belief about that brand and an attribute. Anybody who buys anything buys it for certain reasons, buys it for a certain attribute. For example, I buy Patanjali product. Now I buy Patanjali product because it has a certain attribute which is which says it is herbal, 
right? And the belief that herbal medicines do not cause side effects and are good for health is the belief that is there, is the knowledge that is there. And I know that Patanjali is a herbal product. And so, I buy that because of this attribute. So, the stronger I believe that Patanjali is herbal, which leads me to uh, to the strength to increasing the strength of the belief that it is since it is herbal it is ayurvedic and so it is not going to uh, harm me in any way is basically what is the belief strength and the second component the, of the that makes the effective response of a person is the feeling towards it so based on the strength of the belief based on how strongly i believe that patanjali is herbal and that herbal products leads to better health will also develop a feeling towards the product. The more I see it herbal, the more I see herbs into Patanjali products, the more I see Patanjali products to be natural, the more positive I will feel about it, the more happy I will feel about it, the more accepting I will feel about it. And so, what Fishman model does is actually it looks at how this uh, belief strength and this effective response actually leads to change in the attitude. So, basically the Fishbein model is explained in this way, where in this case the BI is the belief about the extent to which the product has a certain, certain attribute which is a benefit or a cost. So, the belief strength or the knowledge that you know that about a particular product that it has certain features that you want, how strongly you believe that it has that feature and EI is the evaluation weight which is the evaluation of the attribute, which is the desirability of the attribute. Suppose you are going to buy a camera, how strongly you believe that it has a good lens system and EI is the evaluation weight, which is how strongly you want a good lens system into a camera, right. So, both of them together will lead to this particular summation, which is in, in this case, my attitude towards a particular brand is actually a sum of the belief that an attribute i is present in the particular product of which I am forming an attitude. So, product attribute or a brand attribute is basically a function of or a sum of the belief that that particular attribute is there as well as I desire that attribute. Let me explain this through an example. Let us suppose that a radio station is planning on new ad campaign. So, there are lots of radio station and new FM station is planning a an FM station is planning a new ad campaign, but first it wants to know how listeners of this particular radio station feel about the key attributes or the key uh, features of this radio station. So, what it does is this radio station first find out the key attribute that it has. So, my attribute these are the key attributes that the station has which is the I here plays lots of music is one attribute, plays lots of commercial because most radio stations when they are playing music they also play lots of co commercial. So, this is another attribute because if without commercial the radio station cannot work right. So, no matter how a good FM station is and if it is planning an advertisement for it it wants to make a new advertisement. First, it wants to know what people think about its key attribute, its key features and when the key features of this station is, it plays a lot of music. So, how do people think about it, how uh, much they think about it and how much desirable they uh, people are of this key attribute. The th third key attribute is gives news ap updates. So, how much news updates are given by this? how much people believe that news are, updates are given by this uh, this radio station and how interesting is the RJ which is the radio jockey. So, four key attributes I have considered about this radio station and I want to know what people think about it, what is the people at attitude, people's attitude towards these key 
attributes of the radio station. So, what it does is the radio station first finds out the BI component which is the belief component, then it finds out something called the EI component which is the evaluation component, the evaluative component and then it finds out the BI cross EI because attitude A is actually BI into EI, right. So, how does it find BI and how does it find EI? What the radio station does is it gives some product related questions on a 5, 7, 9 point Likert scale to, uh, to people who are the viewers of this radio station. So, questions like for BJ for finding the belief strength, it can give questions like do you believe radio station x, y, z where x, y, z is the radio station in Kansan plays lots of music and then the person has to give an answer on a 7 point scale with minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, plus 1, plus 2 and plus 3 this is minus 3. So, this is my Likert scale and so this question do you believe the radio station x, y, z plays a lot of music is given to the viewers. Now, what the viewers will do is they will mark. So, let us say they mark plus 3. Most people believe that and where plus 3 is very high and minus 3 is very low and 0 is neutral. So, this is the 7 point scale which is given to people and people actually then rate on this right and so let us say that a thousand people rate it and this is the mean. So, plus 3 is the mean. Next what the radio station does is it gives an evaluative question, an evaluative weight question to its viewers. For example, it can give an evaluative question like this, how appealing Do you think playing music is for X, Y, Z radio station? And then again you have to rate it between minus 3 to plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1 minus 2 and minus 3. And so, how appealing means evaluative weight, how desirable do you think playing music is and let us assume that this weight also comes up to plus 3. So, what happens here? When we look at this radio station and how it is evaluating the attitude of people towards its key attribute, we are looking at these key attributes of the radio station and how these key attributes are forming the attitude. So, attitude towards the attribute playing music, we believe that most people believe that the radio station plays a lot of music and this is a key evaluative component. People feel good about it, people desire this particular act. Similarly, and these are the means. So, this is the mean, I will say x or I will put a bar over it which means that it is the mean. Similarly, let me fill up the other ones because I have worked this problem before. So, let us assume that this is a hypothetical data plus 1 and plus 1 here and in this case plus 2 and plus 3. So, this is what I have. Now, what happens is if I look at the final value, I get a value of 9, I get a value of minus 9 here, I get a value of plus 1 here and I get a value of plus 6 here, the total value being plus 7. What is the meaning of all this? From this we believe that most people have a very strong belief about the radio station and they believe that a lot of music should be played. It does play and that should be kept. And this belief evaluative component gives the fact that the radio station is going doing good in this aspect, right. So, it should promote in this message, in its advertisement, it should promote this attribute. But this attribute is not good. Why? Because 
people do not want a lot of commercial and so what the consumer what the radio station should do the service station should do is actually lessen the commercial because if you want if you look at it they believe that the radio station gives a lot of commercials but the desirability of the commercial is very less and so if they do that if they lessen the commercial this is of importance because if the commercials are lessened then people will have positive attitude about that radio station and more people will flock to it similarly if you look into it news update is doing fairly good into it and in terms of dj also this particular uh, radio station is doing good and so a, a plus 7 overall strength is given to this radio station so if the radio station has to come up with a commercial it should focus on its music component as well as uh, the interesting dj because these are very high values and then on some attitude or on some level it should tell that it is also providing news updates so if you want to change attitude if you want to find out attitude about this radio station or this radio station is looking for attitudes of people about its uh, about itself this is what it is and if it is planning a new advertisement campaign the advertisement campaign should actually focus on these attributes so this is how attributes are there and if it wants to change people's attitude or want more people to flock towards it what it should do is it should focus on this and then somehow show them that the registration does not play a lot of commercial or bring down the commercial level because the evaluative criteria which means the desirability of this particular attitude is very less. So, this is the functioning of Fishbane model. Now, how do I how does the Fishbane model propose to change effective response? How does the Fishbane model go about changing the effective response? The first thing that it says is change the BI itself, change the belief. Now, marketers can com communicate to consumers that the brand no longer has a negative attribute, consumers believe it to have or possess a positive attribute of which they are unaware. So, what can happen is the uh, manufacturer or the company in this case my radio station will now come up with an ad campaign which says that it uh, now newer versions of this uh, radio station has very less commercials and that will actually flock more people into it. It will change the belief strength, it will make people believe that it does not have too much co commercial and reduce the amount of commercials which are there. So, one way is to changing the belief itself about the particular attribute of reason. The second thing it can do is change the evaluative criteria, change the desirability of a product. For example, marketers can convince consumers to reassess the evaluation of a particular attribute of a brand. What the com uh, commercial could say, so if it does not, if it cannot lower down the commercial, what it can do is it can cut it down and make an ad campaign in this way so that people reassess this idea do not give them minus 3 in evaluative criteria of commercial say that we need commercials we need commercials to actually function and so some amount of commercial will be there but then we are reducing the commercial and that way when you give them a reason enough why commercials are there most people will be happy to actually go about <coughs> listening to commercials in between music and their evaluative criteria would change. The third way to change attitude according to Fishman model is add a new BI EI combination. So, come up with a new attribute which, which was not there earlier, come up with a new attribute for example, uh, uh, sale promotions or uh, an, uh, uh, lucky draw, some kind of gift coupons that kind of a thing and uh, find out how this is uh, this gift coupon giving by this particular radio station, uh, how much people believe that gift coupons or free offers are given by this uh, radio station or celebrities are called in this radio stations and how much is desirability with this. If you add a new BIEI, if you add a new attribute and the belief of the attribute and the evaluation of the attribute may be due to this a new way of thinking would come about people and people start liking it. So, something with the people were never considering, something that the people never told you about when you asked about a particular radio station, if you bring in a new attribute or highlight an old attribute that people were not thinking about in such a way that people start thinking about it, maybe that leads to changing the attitude to, uh, towards the radio station that we were discussing in the question. So, this is one model. The next important model is called the belief importance model. Now, the only difference between the Fishbein model and the belief importance model is that in the Fishbein model, we were comparing just one service station or just one product for that matter. And in the belief importance model, what we are going to do is we are going to compare a number of companies, a number of products and look at how people uh, uh, change their attitude towards 
a number of products. Now, rarely it happens that people have attitude or people think about one product. If there is a radio station, there will be number of radio stations. And so, people generally compare between them, right? And so, in the fish wine model, we are just looking at one radio station and looking at their belief strength, looking at whether certain attributes, how people think about it, how people will believe about it. But given the fact in a real everyday situation, people do comparison among a number of products or a number of systems. And so, when we are doing that, the belief importance model is of of help there. So, what is the belief importance model? The belief importance model allows marketers to compare effective responses towards competitive brands. When a number of radio station is taken care of, when a number of uh, products are taken care of, when they are competing, how do we compare between them and how do we make people change their attitude towards a particular brand or towards one brand over the other brand, right? So, most people have an evoke set of brands before buying decisions are made. What happens is that when we are buying, as I said, when we are buying, it is not just one station, radio station or just one product or service that we are looking into. We are looking at a competitive number of uh, brands and services. And so, how people uh, evaluate all of them together and uh, change the attitude towards one and fix over one brand is what the belief importance model will focus on. Now, the final selection is made only after we evaluate the desirability of each brand according to the same set of attributes. And so, what the belief model will do is they look at a number of attributes <coughs> that the person wants and compare multiple brands across those attributes and based on that we will find out how people believe about different brands and then provide enough reason for marketers to change their attitude or enough reasons for competing brands to change their attitude or to uh, make new systems, make new ways to change their attitude or to manipulate their uh, people's attitude towards their product. So, <clears throat> what is the, how does the belief importance model actually look at? The belief importance model is actually a formula like this where uh, the preference towards a particular brand is defined in terms of summation of B i 0, where the belief of the i th brand is uh, denoted by B i 0 and i, I uh, 0 or i j is the importance of that particular brand. We will take an example and I will try and show you how does this really work. So, this is my belief towards a particular brand and this is the importance of that particular brand. Now, this belief is about a particular attribute. So, if I have multiple brands, suppose I have four different brands, I will take an attribute, let us say price and then compare all the four brands on the price. So, I will just, uh, and this BI is the belief that how much these four brands, how much the consumer believe that these four brands differ on price or the four brands have different prices and I is the importance of price for these brands. So, let us take an example and try and understand uh, how does this really the model works. So, three brands of uh, athletic shoes are scored on 10 different attributes and we will show you or I will show you how does this really work. So, let us say that uh, a consumer is actually look at, looking at three different brands of uh, shoes and <coughs> He wants to know which shoe, shoe, shoe to buy and he has a favorite brand, but he wants to shift brand. So, how does his attitude change about that? That is one thing important thing and uh, we will look at 10 different attributes that these brands have and we will look at what should a brand do to change its attitude or change people's attitude towards itself. So, uh, in this case, let me draw this way. So, the attributes of importance. 10 different attributes of importance. My first attribute is price, my second attribute is sock absorbency, third is durability, the fourth attribute is color, then fifth attribute is comfort, sixth attribute is arch support, fastener, 
seventh attribute material through which it is made is another attribute specificity of performance or I would say performance is another attribute and country of origin is the last tenth attribute. So, these are the ten attributes on which I will compare three brands of shoes and will then tell you this is my sum this will tell you uh, this will tell you the attitude people have about these shoes and what should a company do actually to change this attitude now once we have this attribute we'll also look at the importance that these attributes have towards a person a consumer how much do they believe that these attributes are dear to them. What is the evaluative criteria they are putting to that? What is the importance of these attributes to them? That is what it is and so out of a hundred importance of 100, let us assign importance which is I naught to these attributes. For example, let us say price has an importance of 20, shock absorbency 10, durability 15, color 15, comfort 20, art support 10, fastener 2, material 2, performance 5 and country of origin 1. So, these are the importance and if you sum it up what you will get is a value of 100, this is the total importance level. Now, let us compare three brands of shoes on these attributes. So, let us take one brand as Reebok, the third second brand as Nike and the third brand as Asahi. Asahi is a German uh, is a Japanese company which actually makes shoes. So, what we are doing here is we are looking at what do people believe, what do consumers believe, what is the attitude of consumers on three different brands of shoes and if a consumer has a positive attitude about a particular shoe, what should the second company do so that consumers attitude towards it is shifted. For that we first find out the number of attributes on which these shoes can be compared and then provide or then uh, get an importance of these attributes together. For example, then what we do is we give these uh, people the pot possible customers questions like, so similar to what happens in the Fishbind model, we give a 7 point scale, a 9 point scale generally here. So, a 9 point scale questions relating to these attributes. For example, how important or how much do you think brand X, X can be anything could be Reebok, could be Nike or could be Asahi has scored on price. So, on basis on the basis of price or how much do you think the price of these brands are? Uh, good for you or you are comfortable with the price of these brands right and so we give a 7 points uh, 9 point scale here starting with minus 5 which says that I am not satisfied with all, with it at all and plus 5 saying that I am fully satisfied with it then I have plus 4, I have plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 minus 4 and minus 5. So, this is the scale and each consumer actually has to rate each of these brands Reebok, Nike and Asahi on this question of price. Let us say the value that I get is minus 2 here, minus 1 here and plus 2 here. Similarly, I have values of plus 3, plus 5, plus 1. So, since the uh, problem has been worked out before, I have worked it out before, let me quickly fill it up and then explain it to you. So, these are the values that I get, these are the mean values that I get on questions that have been put to uh, the people
so these are the values or these are the scale ratings so what are these these values are these generally values are the scale ratings that you get on questions relating to these attributes So, these are the scale ratings that you get which basically means that a price how much people think that Reebok is doing good on price minus 2 people are not satisfied with it. But if you look at Asahi, Asahi people believe has given a good price for it shoes. Similarly, on shock absorbency people believe that Reebok has uh, moderate shock absorbency on, on the other hand Nike has good shock absorbency and Asahi has okay types of shock absorbency and similar to all the attributes. Now, what we will do is we will multiply these scores, these scale values with the importance values. So, 2 into 20 kind of a thing and similarly here 20 multiplied by 20 which will give us a final value and the sum value that I get here is I get 193 for this. This is the overall score for Reebok, this is the overall score for Nike and this is the overall score for Asahi and what does all of this tell the all of this will actually tell what does people attitude about these brands of shoes actually are what is the attitude that people have these uh, brands of attitude. Now, if the company wants to if any company for example, let us say Asahi wants to change people's attitude towards its brand what should it do it should so it, it comes to know that my plus one is the value that it gets in terms of shock absorbency and shock absorbency has a very high importance. So, it should actually improve shock absorbency or put messages, belief messages, knowledge or some kind of information into its ad which which promote the idea that it has good shock absorbency. See, uh, similarly, this durability which has a 15 importance level has a value of plus 1 for Asahi whereas, if you look into these two companies they have uh, Nike and Reebok have very high values or at moderately high values. So, it, it should work on this. So, it should work on similarly what this company we find out that people have very good attitude about Nike, second is Asahi and third is Reebok. So, if Reebok has to do something it has to look at the value scale values here and the importance values and based on that put that message or change people's feeling about that particular uh, attribute into its ad. So, it could come up with an ad for example, let us take an, an any of this for example, uh, in, in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of color. So, in terms of color people rate it as plus 2. Now, if uh, and uh, color is of 15 percent importance or it has a 15 value importance uh, in, in, uh, in, in the consumer's mind this attribute. So, what it could do is it can come up with a message which actually says that now we have uh, the Reebok has more number of colors which will actually help consumers in, in selecting Reebok because they are giving a 15 percent importance to color and so people's attitude towards Reebok as one color shoe will change. So, this is one way or this is one model of how attitudes could be changed first attitudes could be mapped and then attitudes could be changed about uh, particular services and particular brands. So, this is an example of how, how it is. Now, <coughs> Now, let us look at the intention component of attitude. Now, up till now what we were doing is we were looking at the belief component, the cognitive component as well as the second component which is the uh, component of affect and we are looking at these two components of attitude. Now, let us come up to the third component which is called the behavioral component or the behavioral intention component what people do and when they when they feel uh, good about it and when they have knowledge about a particular brand how do they behave that is what we are going to study here and how this behavior can be mapped how this uh, intention to purchase how this behavior to purchase how this willingness to purchase because I might for let us say I am looking for a car. Now, I might have a very good belief about a particular brand of car and feel good about that car, but that feeling good and belief does not lead me in any or does not give any conclusion to whether I am going to buy that car or not. The only way where I where a um, uh, manufacturer can understand how a consumer is going to react what is the consumer's actual attitude or how 
how a consumer is be, uh, is believing or what the consumer is actually doing towards that car is measuring the behavioral intention which is how or uh, 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 in what way is he going to uh, buy that. So, measuring behavioral intention is of importance because measuring of belief strength and measuring of effect does not give us any uh, conclusion on how, uh, whether the consumer will actually convert uh, his belief into an actual purchase. And so, we come to the second component which is the intention component, which is the behavioral component of consumer attitude because the intention will actually tell whether the consumer whether he feels bad or good about a product, whether he is going to buy the product or not. And what is the intention of the manufacturer into the marketplace? The intention of the manufacturer into the marketplace is selling his product. So, measuring the behavioral intention will actually directly provide us reasons or directly provide us hints of whether the consumer is actually going to buy a product or not. So, let us look into it. So, intention is the behavioral component of attitude, the behavioral component as in when I have an attitude, when I have a positive feeling about something and I, and I believe something is good what is my intention towards buying it or what is my inten intention towards purchase of it is what is the behavioral component. Now, the behavioral intention it describes attitude not towards a brand, but towards a brand purchase as I said it does not tell you or behavioral intention will not tell you how you feel about a brand, but it will tell you what, what do you feel about the purchase of the brand, the buying of the brand which is importance, which is of importance and as such is a far better predictor of behavior than either the belief or the effective response because belief and effective response will just tell you how I feel about a particular thing, I idea, person, uh, <coughs> concept, product, service. But whether I will buy that service, whether I will use that service, whether I will go ahead and uh, and purchase that service or a product is measured through behavioral intention and so it is a good predictor. So, studying this is of importance. So, there are two different theories which I will look into closely in, in the, the behavioral intention component. The first theory is called the theory of reasoned action. And so, I will not provide you any example here, but I will just uh, define the theory. The theory is huge. So, what I will suggest is read the book and it has these theories. So, what I will give you is an overview of this theory. So, the theory of reasoned action is one theory of behavioral intention, which actually explains how the consumer feels and how the consumer uh, what is the consumer's intent towards purchase? So, theory of reason action states that behavior is a direct result of intention. When you have an intention towards a purchase, you are more likely to buy a product than if you do not have an intention, but you feel just good about it. So, I might feel good about Apple product, but I may not ever buy it. But if I have an intention of buying it, then the chances are that this intention is very likely going to get converted into a purchase. Now, there are two factors involved in behavioral intention. Any behavioral intention which is the BI component here is made up of two factors. First, the attitude towards the act, how do you feel about it and then the second component is called subject, uh, the normative belief which is composed of how much do you believe other people want you to buy as well as your motivation to comply to it. So, let us look into it. My behavioral intention or my behavioral intention towards a purchase is actually a combination of my attitude towards the purchase, attitude towards the product as well as what consideration I have for other people. So, it is basically Fishbein model added uh, in the Fishbein model if I add uh, the subjective norm, the normative belief or uh, the consideration of other people, it will turn up to be the theory of reason action. So, attitude towards act, it is the sum of the consumer's belief, strength in a uh, consequence that will result from the purchase and the evaluation weight assigned to each of the consequences. So, attitude towards act, A act is actually a summation of my BI and EI. So, uh, remember <coughs> Fishbein model, BI is the belief strength that I believe that a particular product has a particular attribute and EI is the desirability of the attitude. So, if I buy, if I am buying a new camera, what is the belief that I, be, that I, that a particular attribute which is the lens system or the four, uh, the four, uh, the mm, capturing capacity, whether it uses a CCD, the charge coupled device technology or the CMOS technology and if this is of importance to me, this attribute of importance to me, BI is the belief that I believe one of this system, if I, if I like CMOS, how much belief that I have that this new system of uh, camera Canon has CMOS, what is the belief strength that I have, what is the knowledge and this belief strength is dependent on knowledge and EI is how much do I want CMOS technology to be used in my new camera and that will give me an attitude towards that particular camera. So, that is the attitude towards that. In addition to that, uh, the second part of this <coughs> 
theory of reasoned action is the subjective norm. Now, this was not there in Fishwein model. Uh, this is a new addition. Now, in, in terms of intention, see, what I believe is personal to me. But when I want to buy something, I also have to consider other people's advice, people, friends, um, uh, other people around me. I also have to consider their advice because that is of importance to us. And so I add this component of subjective norm or subjective belief into my uh, Fishbein model, my attitude, my personal attitude, and that will decide how much I want to buy a product. So I might like a product, I might like Apple at uh, all that much, I might be a uh, <coughs> a favored person for apple but then my friends say that is not good and so i have to and i value them and so i have to consider that also and when i consider that also it reduces my attitude towards that that is the importance of it so subjective norm what is it it is our perception of what other people think we should do with respect to certain behavior such as brand purchase so if i'm going to buy something i also consider what other people do now how is how is subjective norm defined it is determined by normative belief and motivation to comply. What is normative belief? So, two parts of it, two components of it, the subjective norm component. So, the theory of reason hack, uh, reason action has two parts. One is my personal attitude, the other is what other people think which is called subjective norm. Now, this subjective norm has two components. The first component is something called normative belief and the second is motivation to comply. What is normative belief? Is the perceived expectation that significant others think the consumer should not uh, behave in a certain way. For example, I want to buy a new brand of camera and I am looking at one attitude or two at attribute of that camera. One is the lens system, the other is the technology used for developing the photos. Now, I want a good lens system, a good aperture system as well as a CMOS technology into it. Now, if, if I know that it has these two values and I want these two into it, I have positive attitude towards it. But buying that camera will also depend upon other people in my life because Normative belief is what other people believe about Nike and the attributes of concern. CMOS, for example, if I have a very close friend who is a good photographer and he says that CMOS is not a good technology. So, that I will consider and so then I might not go for CMOS as a good attribute or I might not go for Nike as a good camera because he values to me, right? So, that is one thing. Normative belief is what other people think about my actions and the second part of it is motivation to comply. Now, uh, other people might think that CMOS is not good, uh, friend of mine might think that CMOS is not a good technology or uh, I should not consider it. But then personally speaking, I believe that CMOS is a good technology and my motivation to comply, my motivation to listen to him and consider his views into my buying is zero. It could be very high, it could be very low. So, this motivation to comply is another factor, <coughs> is the extent to which the consumer considers the possible option, opinion of significant other where forming an intention to purchase. So, this subjective norm is actually a combination of my normative belief. This is the j -th belief, I can have n number of beliefs and so this is the j -th belief and similarly I have, I could have n number of motivation to comply for the j -th belief and that is the j. So, combining these two things together, my final formula for behavioral intention, my form, final formula for behavioral intention or behavior to buy is behavior to buy or my behavior is actually a function of behavioral intention which is a function of attitude towards that particular brand. And this W1 and W2 are weights which are assigned and there is a method of assigning these weights. So, it is it's, it's out of this uh, the reference here. So, I am not defining it but then there are certain weights, the system of assigning weights. So, this behavioral intention to purchase is actually a function of attitude that I have towards the purchase plus the subjective norm plus how much I value other people's advice and how much advice other people are giving to me. If I add them together, I will get the final intention and I will get the final belief. And so, this is what my <coughs> theory of reason action looks like. My behavior is actually a component of attitude towards act and subjective norm which is actually a behavioral intention and this is resultant of belief about consequences of behavior and evaluation of consequences of behavior which is the attitude towards that and normative belief related to different sources and motivation to comply to different sources. So, these two added together will give me a behavioral intention and then a final behavior. So, this is my theory of reasoned action. And then how do I apply the theory of reasoned action to change consumers intention? First, 
the model guides the marketer to identify those attributes most important in causing consumers to develop positive or negative at, uh, attitudes toward the purchase of the product. So, the first thing that the marketer can do is find out those attributes which make a product likable. That is it. Find out those attributes which consumers like and promote the, those attributes. First thing I can do and that can lead to attitude change. The second thing changing attitude towards purchase. I can change people's attitude towards purchase. For example, if I give the right attributes and people like it, then people's attitude towards purchase will be changed. I can also change people's subjective norm. Give them enough reasons why they should not trust other people in their life in the purchase or give them enough reasons why they should not comply to what other people say. So, give them enough reasons why they should sub trust themselves and not other people in their life or provide them enough reasons of what other people are saying and how does it translate to the actual purchase. If you can do that, then you can change people's attitude. So, how is the uh, theory of reason action changing consumer intention? <coughs> The next theory is a little bit detailed theory. So, what I will do is I will just go over it and I will not explain to you in detail. There is a book and there are lots of books which will actually explain it. So, I will, I will go about it and this what does the theory of trying actually do? Now, up till now behavioral intention is how much do you want to buy a product? That was what behavioral intention is all about and we looked at the theory of trying. Now, the theory of trying is for something that you buy for consumption. Now, consumption can be of two types. You buy a product and eat it. This is called or use it. This is called fixed consumption. But then there can be a consumption which is actually uh, a more use use kind of a thing. A consumption which uh, which is varied over a uh, uh, time. For example, let's look at. Uh, cooking lessons. Now, cooking lessons here the consumption pattern is varying over time. Consumption is not you just go do not go buy a, con a cooking lesson and it is end of it. You have to prax practice it. Learning tennis, learning uh, music. Now, the, here the consumption process is not just buying the thing and using it. You have to go through it for a period of time and for those kind of things for example, joining the gym. If that is what it is, here the consumption process is basically distributed over a period of time and so on those, those cases, on those consumption patterns, the change in behavioral intention or the measure of behavioral intention is done through by something called theory of trying. Let us take the example of somebody who is trying to lose weight. <clears throat> so, let us say person A. Ram is trying to lose weight or Sita is trying to lose weight. Now, if that is what it is, how can I measure the behavioral intention of Sita towards a particular Arabic uh, classes, a particular uh, gym, gymnasium that she joins. Now, let us start from here. The theory of trying says that Sita's attitude or Sita's behavioral intention towards joining the gym is dependent on three things, frequency of past trying. How much in the past has Sita actually tried to lose weight and it is also component of recency of trying. How recently has this person Sita actually tried a gym? How recently she has been to a gym and in the past how many times she has been to the gym? And then also the, uh, in, uh, the so, uh, social norms towards trying. What other people think? Well, how much does she value other people's advice in terms of trying the gym? So, S uh, Sita actually trying a new gym is dependent on three factors. First factor is how frequently she has been to the gym in the past. Second, what does she believe? Other people believe about her in joining the gym. What do you think? What Sita thinks that other people has to say about she joining the gym? And it is also dependent upon how in the recent past, how many times she has actually been to the gym, the recency of past trying, how recently she has try, tried this thing. And so, this is called intention to try. So, the intention to try will lead to trying. So, intention to try is actually influenced by frequency of past trying and social norms and <coughs> this trying is also ex, uh, influenced by recency of trying. Now, the intention to try, this behavior intention in, in terms of intention to try, so intention to try in, in terms of theory of trying is behavioral intention. This behavioral intention is actually composed of, the intention to trying is composed of three parts. First thing, it is composed of attitude toward trying and this attitude toward trying is composed of three parts, the attitude toward success, the attitude towards failure and the attitude toward the process. Attitude towards success is how much does Sita believe? that 
<coughs> she will succeed in losing weight first thing that will decide her attitude towards the gym and that will decide whether she wants to join the gym or not and then the second part is how much Sita expects that she is going to get success in terms of losing weight to the gym if she joins it. The second part of it is how much Sita believes that she is going to fail in terms of losing weight and the expectation that she is going to fail and how much Sita believes that the process of gym, the use of gym is going to lose weight, how much, what attitude she has. And so based on that, this attitude towards success is based on, as we looked at, this attitude towards success is based on the belief about consequences and the evaluation of consequences. The attitude towards failure is, uh, is related to belief about consequences as well as consequences related to failure as well as evaluation of failures and the attitude towards uh, process is related to belief about consequences related to processes as well as evaluation of process. So basically what Sita's trying of a new gym is dependent on how frequently she has been to a gym in the past, how recently she has tried it and what do she thinks other people think about it which itself depends upon her attitude towards trying which is actually dependent on her attitude towards success, attitude towards failure and attitude towards the process of using gym to lose weight and this attitude towards success is also uh, in, is enriched or is, is supported by her expectation, how much she believes that she is going to success, how much she believes that she is going to fail and all this combined together will actually tell whether Sheeta is going to try a new gym that I have come up with, a new gym that I have proposed. So this is the theory of trying. So how does, it, how do you apply the theory of trying to uh, change in consumer behavior? The value of the theory of trying is it is focused on consumption behavior rather than purchase behavior. Now as I said some purchases are instant, some purchases are over a period of time and so why it is important? It is important because theory of trying focuses on consumption behavior over a period of time which is spread over a period of time and so it is important. Second, marketers have to go beyond controlling the purchase act and seek to encourage support and reward the consumption act. So what the marketer can do is not only want Sita to buy the membership of the gym but also help her think positive towards the gym and give her enough reasons so that she goes to the gym and believe that she is going to succeed through the gym in losing weight because that is the final goal. So it has to do things, the manufacturer has to do things over a period of time so that Sheeta develops this positive attitude towards success, lowers her negative attitude towards failure and believes that the process of gymming, the process of going to a gym is actually going to lose weight, right. So it has to do this, uh, these things if the, uh, if the marketer does that will lead to her positive attitude and joining the gym. <coughs> now the last section <coughs> here that we do is something called the attitude behavior in uh, consistency. So basically what is it? Now a positive attitude towards a product or product purchase does not necessarily lead to buying. If I have a positive attitude about a particular thing or a particular product person or product class service, it does not mean that I am going to buy it. So what happens is that attitude behavior consistency is the extent to which attitude leads to purchase. So I have to measure this consistency of attitude and behavior. The more consistent the attitude and behavior is, the higher the chances that I will make the purchase and so a good thing in terms of attitude is to measure the behavioral attitude consistency. Now attitude determined, the purchase, attitude determined purchase is determined by consumer factors, situational factors and measurement factors. So three factors actually decide whether somebody who has a positive attitude about something or a particular feature, a particular product is actually going to buy it or not. <coughs> so let us look at consumer influences. What are the consumer influences? What are the consumer factors which, uh, which leads to attitude behavior consistency which means, which means which leads to actual increase in purchases? The consumer's access to resources. How much the consumer has access to resources? It may happen that the consumer wants to buy it, it has a positive attitude towards something and wants to buy a product but he does not have enough money and so those, those factors can actually lead to not buying a product. So whether the consumer has money to buy and what can the marketer do to improve this? He can, the marketer can provide installments, can provide long term financing, can provide reduced rates, these can help the consumers actually buying. So all those techniques of providing EMI, giving <coughs> loans, giving long term loans, giving installments actually help the consumer in buying. When the consumer does not have money but he has a positive attitude towards a particular purchase and a particular behavioral intent, positive behavioral intent, what the marketer can do is these things. 
the second factor consumer factor which <coughs> increases this attitude behavior consistency is consumers past experience with the brand now product trials so if a consumer how much consumer has in the past how, what kind of experience that he has with the brand now the thing is it could have the consumer could have a bad experience with the brand now what the marketer can do to improve this it can provide product trials or similar incentives to increase consumer experience so what the marketer can do is it can make in situations where the consumer actually uses the product in the presence of the marketer and the marketer can show what is good about the product so that kind of a situation will actually help and the third thing the third factor is consumers orientation now there are two type of consumers one is called the action consumer and the other is called the action state consumer and the state uh, and the <coughs> state uh, uh, oriented consumer and the action oriented consumer is the one which takes immediate action i'll do it i want to buy it i'll go ahead and buy it that kind of a thing and the state oriented consumer is the one which actually waits for some time and then uh, makes the purchase right so he waits so what the uh, what the marketer can do is what it can look at both this type of two different kind of consumers orientation and depending on that make necessary changes into his product or advertisements and make the buying a success now there are certain situational factors also which uh, affect the relationship between attitude and behavior for example what is the time passed between attitude development and opportunity to buying if there is enough time which has passed between uh, the, the attitude development and opportunity to buying the chances of buying behavioral intention towards buying increasing actually decreases so what the what the marketer can do here is it can from time and again if a consumer has um, thought about a buying a product it can ask its people to get back to him over over a period of time and then uh, <coughs> give them new news about what is good about their product and so on and so forth the second factor which affects attitude behavior consistency is through high level of message repetition attitude towards the brand can be translated into brand purchase so high level of repetition can be done about the message and that leads to high level of uh, purchase and the second thing is social influences is a strong factor affecting the extent to which a brand attitude translates into brand purchase so you can have social groups which actually influence a consumer so situational factors example good social groups can actually help translate into final purchases or good purchases that's one of the important factor now there are certain measurement factors also which uh, define the relationship between attitude and behavior and one of it is the relationship between intention and behavior is influenced by the level of specificity of measurement how specific the measurement is done for example remember the honda accord advertisement where we looked at the level of specificity so if the <coughs> if attitude is measured about honda itself that's not enough but if uh, measure of the attitude is done towards the honda car of a particular model of a particular year of a particular uh, let's say place then the measure of specificity is very high for example attitude can predict behavior only if measured with a high level of specificity so not only looking at 1995 honda is good if if i can get the attitude of a uh, of somebody of a 1992 honda accord lxi model brought from a particular showroom if that have, that is what i can do then <clears throat> the chances are attitude behavior consistency would be there so i can have a positive attitude about a company but negative attitude about a particular car i have i believe uh, maruti is good but maruti wagon r is bad that kind of a thing so wagon r or wagon r lxi is bad that can happen and so for uh, you for a person marketer to measure or to translate this attitude behavior into purchase what it has to do is it has to be very specific of measuring also the second thing is when consumers are asked about the attitudes the timing of measurement is also important for example let's say that uh, uh, i am measuring your attitude towards buying milk on a friday now generally saturday i buy milk and so on if i ask you on friday whether you want to buy milk or not since saturday is the day i want i say milk buying is a positive thing right because saturday i buy milk but if i ask this question to uh, to you on monday then there is no immediacy and so in in those cases what would happen is the uh, timing of measurement is uh, is actually ill ill uh, put here or towards some other place here and so what would happen in those cases is that the attitude that you measure uh, the atti the timing of measurement will not actually provide you the right attitude about uh, the particular behavior uh, of buying and that will not translate into the actual purchase so the timing of measurement of when you measure the attitude is also of importance to uh, us in <coughs> terms of attitude behavior consistency so if you look into the attitude behavior consistency this is my attitude and this is my behavior and if you look into it these are the characteristics of the consumer situation and measurement of what defines how the attitude behavior consistency actually defines uh, attitude now <coughs> 
what we did in this class is we actually looked at certain models of attitude and we looked at how these models actually predict attitude right and what are the factors so how is attitude made and how these attitudes can be changed. So, we looked at the model of Fishbein where we looked at how the belief strength and expectation of that <coughs> particular belief or that particular attribute is of importance. We look at the belief importance model where we looked at not only one product but we compared products across situations. We also looked at the behavioral intention component, the <coughs> intention component of behavior and how does that measure attitude or what does it say about attitude. So, that, that is another thing that we looked at. So, in, in the behavior in intention section which says that attitude is not an actual measurement of purchase. What is the actual measurement of purchase? Behavioral intention. How much do you want to buy is actually a measurement of how good attitude you have or what good faith you have or toward a particular product. That is what it is. And so, in the behavioral intention section, what we focused on is two theories. We focused on the theory of reasoned action where we looked at subjective norms and attitude towards act in combination defining my final attitude towards the purchase or behavioral intention towards the purchase and also looking at the theory of trying which says that if the consumption is distributed over a period of time, if the consumption process is a long thing, it is not just buying a product and ending it. In those cases, how does the uh, thing translate? How does my attitude translate into buying? Then we looked at attitude behavior consistencies because positive attitude leads to positive behavior which leads to final positive uh, purchase. So, we looked at three different factors, we looked at situational factors, we looked at consumer factors, we looked at measurement factors which actually affect the final purchase intention which is the final buying of the product. So, what determines my final buying of the product and the final change of attitude towards the final purchase change in purchase intention towards the final purchase because any manufacturer is interested in selling his product and is interested in how much the consumer is actually going to buy the product. So, in this class we focused on to this and this is what we were doing. In the next class we will again meet and discuss uh, things uh, on a new section on <coughs> something called co consumer communication. So, advertisements and how does advertisements actually help or advertisement as such in terms of psycholo as a psychological factor actually helps the consumer behavior. So, thank you.